Friday, the 25th of November. In aggregate, European stocks are a little softer today. Crucially, though, they're up on the week. The countdown to the close starts right now. The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. So we're close to wrapping up the European session. European stocks are a little softer. We've been rolling over over the last hour. Um, it's a bit of a reversal from yesterday. Energy outperforming today as oil stocks go back up, as oil goes back up. Uh, and you've got the real estate sector, which benefited yesterday uh, on the, uh, the Fed yield story, but today giving back quite a lot of those uh, gains that we made yesterday. So the stock 600 in aggregate, trading 440, down by around two-tenths of 1%. Very, very light volume. Um, I mentioned what was happening with the euro uh, just a few moments ago. The pound is also a little bit weak. We're still trading circa 121. And I just wanted to flag Just Eat. It's down by 1.25% today. I would have thought it's going to have a fairly good night tonight. I keep coming back to the football. The World Cup is on. Today is a very big day in Group B. I would have thought Just Eat might have a good night. We'll wait and see whether people are ordering in. Ed Ludlow, what's happening stateside? I'm sure you're going to be watching that game. I am going to be watching that game. 90 minutes into a shortened session, light volumes the day after Thanksgiving and stocks broadly flat on the S&P 500. There's some dollar strength at play here and energy pushing higher as a sector. Also seeing yields continue to creep a little higher on the shorter end of the curve you see on the two year. Uh, two specific stocks we're looking at, Activision Blizzard down more than 4%, a report from Politico stating that the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, will make some sort of intervention uh, on Microsoft's bid to buy the video game maker, and that could come as soon as next month. The other one that we're looking at, Guy, Manchester United, publicly traded at least a minority stake of it here in the United States, up more than 16%. We knew earlier in the week that the club would potentially be put up for sale by the Glazers, uh, its owners, but the latest news being comments from Prince Abdulaziz bin Turki Al Faisal from Saudi Arabia, saying that the Saudi government would back a private sector bid to buy Manchester United if that were to be the case. And clearly that stock continuing to rise on the idea that some sort of financial transaction is possible. Would make the games against Newcastle a little more interesting. Ed, thank it you was. very much indeed. Ed Ludlow, great stuff. Thank you very much. I'm sure Ed will be sneaking out to watch the game. Um, let's talk about what is happening with European politics. The German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is worried that France is on the, uh, the edge of stoking a trade war with the United States. We've just been hearing from the French Prime Minister, uh, Elizabeth Bourne. She's in Berlin. She's uh, standing side by side uh, with Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor. She was speaking about the US Inflation Act, the US Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, and how it potentially could distort competitiveness. The French in particular are very worried about it. Emmanuel Macron goes to Washington, D.C. next week. European Trade Commissioner uh, Valdis Dombrovsky is speaking a little bit earlier to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo, trying to maybe avoid this whole idea that a trade spat is imminent. EU and U.S. share a strategic partnership, and I would say it's especially important in a current geopolitical uh, context when we are uh, dealing with Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine. So it's important that we are uh, cooperating and we are uh, uh, united, and that's uh, indeed why it's so important that this uh, Inflation Reduction Act is being addressed and it doesn't become uh, another irritant in our uh, relations. An irritant. The French may see it as a little bit more than an irritant. Remember, the Inflation Reduction Act has a big Buy America component embedded within it, and it comes into force at the beginning of next year. Um, Judy Dempsey, non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie Europe, joining us now to discuss. Judy, do the Europeans have a right to be angered by the IRA? I often wonder about this because actually there are some countries in the European Union that are actually providing pretty hefty subsidies to their own consumers and their own population. One of them is Germany, a huge billion package, billion something package unveiled uh, several weeks ago. But I mean, there's something fundamental here. And this is energy. And energy is so divisive among the European Union members. And it's this divisive um, in, uh, in the transatlantic relationship. But Biden has his own constituency to deal with and inflation and buy America first. And the Europeans have been taken off the hop and now they fear this is going to be a trade war. I sometimes think they're 
overreacting. OK, so maybe an overreaction and maybe there's a way of diffusing the situation. But do you think we could see a European equivalent? Could we be seeing some of the rules, um, some of the funds available out of Brussels maybe being used to deliver a similar effect? If this could be the case, because the, uh, the ministers, the energy ministers and the trade ministers and prime ministers, they're quite divided now over what's called a, a, a gas cap, a, a, a cap over energy prices. And some of the, the southern European countries want it because of inflation, the higher energy prices, how it's affecting their votes, how it's affecting the consumers. And some of the other countries, like Germany, don't want it because it'll distort prices. And not only that, it will inhibit um, their imports and their ability to be flexible. And this has been going on for several weeks now, and there's still no agreement in the midst of a huge energy crisis. And, OK, the e European Union is beginning to deal with it in terms of filling up the storage facilities, but they cannot agree on which way to go forward now. Sharing, a kind of solidarity, transportation, diversification, but more fundamentally uh, at all, uh, is, is actually sharing uh, the gas. And if you share gas, you have to have a common price, and this isn't going to happen at the moment. So, so the cap is looking very difficult, but what about providing some sort of funds that mm. could be used for, um, for building infrastructure. The, the Inflation Reduction Act is basically subsidising a, a lot of green energy, um, uh, sustainable energy transition technology uh, to be built in the United States. Uh, and it, and it, it could have a major effect. You're already seeing a number of big companies, I think Enel was one this week, talking about moving production to the United States. How does Europe counter that? The interesting aspect of Europe is that it's been very slow to modernise its energy structure and the infrastructure. It's been a very slow to have an absolute common policy on energy. And we've seen this uh, after the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. The writing was on the wall, the dependence on Russia. And now they have to deal very, very quickly with this. And somehow they're now looking at the United States and saying, gosh, President Biden is giving these huge subsidies. Well, Germany is giving huge subsidies. Other countries are giving huge, huge subsidies. But if you go for a big EU package subsidy, you're on to something the equivalent of how they dealt with the, 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 the corona COVID crisis. There was a huge recovery package there. Are we talking about a re recovery package here in the energy sector? It's going to be very difficult to get agreement on this because there are so many yeah. different elements of, of energy. Olaf Schultz talking about the fact we must do everything, he says, to support our companies. That press conference uh, just wrapping up with Elizabeth Bourne. Um, France and Germany, let's spend a little time talking about that because we do have this uh, trip by Emmanuel Macron next week to Washington, D.C. I was at an event in Berlin um, last week. It was an aerospace event. A lot was trying to be made of the fact that, that France and Germany are on the same page, but the fact that so much was being made of it told me that France and Germany aren't on the same page. And I'm hearing this time and time again at different events. I indeed, even the French uh, Prime Minister and, and the German Chancellor just a moment ago having to address this issue. Why is the engine that is at the centre of Europe, Judy, not running as smoothly as it once did? The engine isn't running because um, Macron and Olaf Scholz on very different communication levels. Um, Macron has the big European view of how to take energy, how to take defence industry, how to take the political integration of Europe further. Olaf Scholz is much more, dare I say, provincial. He doesn't communicate that well on how he deals with the future of Europe. And he's been very slow to pick up on what Macron wants or even to push back. This is the first thing. Secondly, they have completely different ideas of defence. And remember, France is the military hard power of Europe. Yeah. Germany is the economic power of Europe. And bringing them closer together to kind of get a, a kind of middle ground is going to be extremely difficult. And there are an awful lot of divisions, as it is, in Olaf Scholz's uh, big coalition. So is, is, is Emmanuel Macron going to be speaking for France or is he going to be speaking for Europe next week? Hmm. He will wear a French hat, of course. And he will push the European agenda when it comes to energy and for pre President Biden's big package. 
will he be speaking for Europe? I think he will in terms of the transatlantic relationship, because we must remember that Macron actually, despite all the criticisms of some of the East European countries about Macron being very Gaullist and just looking after France's own interests in the European context, he really yeah. does need the transatlantic relationship and the NATO security umbrella at the moment because there's too much distrust among the European member states among each other. Well, I bring it up as well because when Olaf Scholz went to China, he sounded like he was trying to speak for Europe there. And, and it's really interesting that, that Macron's going to D.C., Scholz went to China, and, and that kind of thing just encapsulates the problem that we have here at the moment. Europe doesn't know which way to look. Europe is in an incredibly difficult situation and uh, Chancellor Schulz's visit to China did not go down well among most of the European member states. Uh, he went for, on, for German national interests and business interests. And when Lithuania, the Baltic states, has a spat with China over Taiwan, for instance, the Germans didn't support Lithuania on this. Germany, uh, Germany is in a very difficult situation because it's in the beginning of a deindustrialization because of the Russian war in Ukraine, because of the energy issue, because of the whole impact of, of, of globalization of this war and other issues. And somehow Germany is clinging on to the old kind of interests while in fact it should be trying to think out of the box and realize that the, the Americans and the Europeans have to work much, much closer together on trade issues, on economic issues, on security issues and defense issues. Yeah. Germany went alone in China and this was a mistake. What does a deindustrialized Germany look like? What does a deindustrialized Germany stand for? What does a deindustrialized Germany do? Well, it's certainly the nice big buzzword, which uh, very few want to define it. But essentially, we'd have to look at the whole kind of industrial base that the German economy is based on. And this is based on exports, especially the car industry, chemicals, production, manufacturing. These industries require huge amounts of energy. And if Germany wants to make the transition to a renewable energy and green economy, they will actually have to make this transition to rare earth materials, but actually recon re reconfigurate the entire structure of the economy. And it's going to be very, very difficult. I think there's a, a fear of this change in the German psychology. And maybe this is one of the reasons why Scholz went to China to try to make at least consolidate some of the some of the trade connections for the moment, but at the end of the day, Europe especially will have to change because of how this Russian impact is fundamentally affecting how the economies are ordered, how employment is dealt with, how to fund infrastructure developments, and essentially which way trade passions are going to go. This is why the Biden package is very interesting. He says America first, and the, Ameri the Europeans are scared. Do they run to China? They can't go to Russia. Do they run to Southeast Asia? Or do they try to actually deal with the United States and say, OK, let's deal with this together? It's going to be an interesting week next week. Judy, as thoughtful as ever, thank you very much indeed. We really appreciate it. Judy Dempsey, non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie Europe. Coming up, uh, daily COVID numbers hitting record highs in China. Uh, more on China's reopening struggles next. This is Bloomberg. So China's struggles with COVID continue. Today, well, actually, I think yesterday's numbers, we saw a new record level of infections, cases topping 30,000 Thursday. First time we've ever seen that. Uh, Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now on the phone from San Francisco, uh, our resident expert on all things COVID. Sam, it, isn't it to be expected you have an unvaccinated population and you have COVID within that population, you reopen that population, you are going to see numbers rising and rising very sharply? Uh, hi, Guy. Um, well, I mean, they are vaccinated. They're just not as highly vaccinated as some Western societies. 
for example. But even the vaccine, as we know, you know, I've had COVID twice and I've had three shots of the vaccine. Um, you've had it. You've had shots of the vaccine. That doesn't make much difference to catching an infection. And so what, what China needs to learn over time, and I think this is going to be a, a long process of, of learning, is, to, is how the West has got to that point of living with the virus. Uh, and that all comes down to what level of disease, what level of hospital attendance, etc., they're prepared to accept. Uh, and, and there's just no other way of fast-forwarding this, vaccine or no vaccine. Obviously, with the vaccines, you reduce the severity and the impact on, on healthcare uh, uh, logistics, etc., supply. But other than that, there is really no other way of doing this. OK, so what trajectory, and this is really important for the global economy, what trajectory do you think China is on now with COVID? How long is it going to take? Well, if you think about how, how long it took the West to get here, um, so, so, so mo most of the Western countries, it's about two and a half years, right? Since, since March till about June, when the fatality rate, and of course there are many other things to worry about with COVID than just fatality, but with the fatality rate as, as a percentage of cases has become really a lot, lot lower and, and people d do not end up in hospital anywhere near as much as they did before vaccines. Two and a half years, roughly, I think that took. So if you assume that there is going to be the same for China, if you just take that number. If they reopen and completely don't do anything in terms of controlling infection rates of some form or one way or another, uh, you could be facing hundreds of millions of infections and a, a number of people that, that would be requiring ICU, which will just not be viable. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? You don't have the depth in the, uh, in the healthcare system maybe to cope with, with that, but those are big numbers, so I don't think anybody would have that kind of depth. Sam, you're bopping around the world at the moment. What are you seeing in terms of how people are behaving or not behaving with reference to the pandemic, to, with, with COVID? Are you what are you expecting this winter, for instance, in the United States? Yeah, so, look, um, Guy, I've been... Uh, let's count this. It's London, France, which is where I live, uh, Boston, New York, Toronto, and now San Francisco. Every place I visit, life is completely normal. People on the plane, there are, of course, those who feel the necessity to re wear a mask, and everybody respects that choice. But really, that's the only sign you see of, of any pandemic still existing, which, of course, the virus is very much with us. So um, I, I, I think expectations for the winter, I mean, if you look back, in the summer, everybody expected a big wave of infections going into the winter ahead of the holidays, which kind of um, uh, we're just right now going through. So let's see how this goes. But a lot of people expected November to be the, 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 the month that cases start climbing rapidly. And we haven't really seen that. So how this is all playing out, how much of it is to do with vaccines and the fact that we've had vaccines and people, some people have had the bivalent shots. Tough to tell, but currently not seeing much. The bigger worry, of course, Guy, and I'll stop there in a minute, is, is the combination of RSV, flu and COVID at the same time. Yeah, and you're certainly seeing the latter two. You're certainly seeing uh, a big pickup in RSV, and certainly I can attest to this, there's an awful lot of the cold around at the moment. Sam Fazelli, thank you very much indeed. Safe travels. Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence joining us from San Francisco. Coming up... Oil heads for a third weekly loss. We're going to look at what's weighing on crude. China, certainly part of the puzzle. That's next. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Ritika Gupta. Bloomberg's learned the European Central Bank is imposing higher capital requirements on lenders including BNP Paribas and Deutsche Bank. It argues the banks have ignored warnings to cut risk in the lucrative business of leveraged finance. Deutsche Bank executives have said they don't agree with the ECB. Shares of Credit Suisse fell to an all-time low today. Investors are weighing the impact of the massive outflows the Swiss bank reported this week. Credit Suisse said the clients had withdrawn $89 billion in the first six weeks of the fourth quarter. 
And shares of Manchester United are higher. Saudi Arabia's sports minister told BBC Sports that the government would support private sector bids for the team as well as for Liverpool Football Club. Earlier this week, Manchester United's owners said they were exploring strategic options that could lead to a full sale. And that is your latest business flash. Guy. Rika, thank you very much indeed. Uh, crude looks like it's going to be down this week, both, both for WTI and Brent. Um, the global demand outlook, certainly a, uh, a factor. Uh, you've also got the EU discussions on a price cap for Russian crude weighing on oil. Um, another weekly loss. I think this will be the third weekly loss the week could be heading for for crude. Brent crude over the last month um, is down by nearly 9%. This is a pretty big move. Uh, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg Deputy Managing Editor uh, for Energy and Commodities, Simon Casey. Simon, this has been a, a move that has really played out over the last month and the losses are substantial. Is it possible to put your finger on one thing and say this is the reason why? Is it China? Is it the, the crude cap discussion around Russia that the EU is having right now? Is it concerns about the US economy sliding into recession next year? I'm kind of wondering what the combination looks like. I think, Guy, uh, you've got to point to China, um, the world's second biggest oil consumer, and obviously the lockdown situation there. It looks pretty bad. I mean, you were just talking to Sam earlier before the break. You know, he, he outlined the, the, the dilemma, the real real sticky situation that China finds itself in that. And, and, you know, the oil market's looking at that. It's seeing very real sort of weakness in, in oil demand and also looking ahead for the next few months. I mean, when is it going to recover? At some stage, you've got to imagine that things will open up again. But at the moment, there's no real clear sign of how that's going to, that's going to unfold. Are we going to get a response from OPEC? I, these are, these are, we're now getting down to the levels that OPEC is very determined to defend. Well, I mean, it's, we, we saw a production uh, surprise production cut, of course, back in October. Um, would it do more at this stage? It's unlikely. We've, we've got a, a meeting coming out next week. Um, and you know, we, need to, we need to, I think we, OPEC is going to watch a bit more and see how things are going to play out. There are, there, in addition to the, the headline price, and we can all see where Brent is at the moment, it's around about $85, and that's substantially down from where it was earlier this year. There are a few other things that the, that the oil market is looking at. You know, one of the things it's looking at is the spread of forward prices. Um, Brent has now split very close to what we would call a, a contango. That means that forward prices are now much higher than immediate prices, spot prices. Yep. That's already flipped, as you know, in WTI. I mean, that, that's the, probably the biggest warning sign at the moment. Um, if it does, if it doesn't happen at this OPEC meeting, it could be the next OPEC meeting. OK. Simon, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Really useful update. Simon Casey, the European closes next. This is Bloomberg. So we're wrapping up the, uh, the Friday session, the week session for European markets. As you can see, this session unlikely to go down as one of the classics. Um, basically, most main markets are unchanged. The DAX is unchanged, the CAC is unchanged. The FTSE is eking out a three-tenths of 1% gain. Um, volume is very light. The US has a shortened session today. Even in that shortened session, people really aren't trading. So you, you've got basically a, a market in hibernation waiting for the beginning of next week. Next week, I think, holds some interesting clues, I think, uh, to where we're going uh, on the more medium-term basis. This is the, uh, the story over the last five days. The, the conundrum a lot of people are scratching their heads about at the moment is why are European stocks outperforming? Is it the euro, uh, the, the cyclical elements of, of many of these European markets? you strip out even energy are still doing well. The fi basically, financials and energy continue to perform very, very strongly. Uh, and these two areas are driving European markets to some outperformance. This week, uh, we're up by nearly 2%. We're trading at 440. Uh, and as you can see, we've been basically going uh, left to right, up, up, up. The last couple of days, we've been basically drifting sideways with the US out for Thanksgiving. Uh, in terms of the, the sector story, I mentioned it. This is over the last five days. And I mentioned some of those, those sort of cyclical elements. Uh, media's up, energy's up, travel and leisure's up. The mining sector's up as well. So that's where you're kind of seeing the, the, the strength. Banks are up by around 2% on the week. Only a few sectors down this week. Autos, and interestingly enough, the luxury sector has actually given back some ground this week. 
Keep an eye on what's happening in China. I think you probably want to pay attention to that. Uh, certainly some interesting notes are being written about how European luxury, which has done very well recently, maybe, maybe is a little overexposed now. Um, let's talk about some single stocks and, and what we've seen today and just give you an idea of what's going on. Credit Suisse, I, I keep coming back to it. I think we're down 17% this week. It might even be a little bit more now. We're down by 6.56% on the session today. It has been a very tough week for Credit Suisse management. We had the EGM. We saw an update in terms of the outflows from the wealth business. That is a serious cause for concern. ABF, the Western family, owner, of course, of Primarks and big investments uh, going in there. That stock rising today, very tightly held. Uh, and then I just want to mention Just Eat. Um, the reason I mention this is not because the stock is trading lower, uh, but because it gives me an opportunity to talk about the fact uh, that we are going to be seeing a quite important football game taking place a little bit later on today. England versus the United States. Um, and I would have thought quite a few people may be ordering in as a result of that. We'll see how that stock trades on Monday. Maybe they'll update us on what the game looked like. Certainly the World Cup, good for these kinds of stocks. Um, so that's the picture for this week. Let's talk about next week. Now, next week, we've got a whole bunch of data coming out. US payrolls, obviously, front and centre. We've got Powell speaking. But here in Europe, we get inflation numbers from the Eurozone, from Germany, from France, from Spain, from Italy. Um, and... We also get, of course, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge over in the US. The US PCE number uh, is going to be published as well. We've heard from a number of European central banks over the last few days about their efforts to bring inflation down. I do think that it makes sense on our side to be a little bit on the slower side compared to what we have done in the past. Mandatory is price stability. So as long as inflation is well above 5%, we may need to continue. Doing so requires raising interest rates further for as long as needed to put inflation back on a sustainable path towards 2%. Although my bias is towards further tightening. We will need to be mindful. Adjusting too little will leave inflation too high. And adjusting too much could lead to an unnecessarily painful downturn. Because then we can see what happens in the economy, in the economy as a whole and to what extent what we have done uh, really, really sort of takes hold. If the economy develops differently to my expectation and persistence in inflation stops being a concern, then I'd consider the case for reducing bank rate as appropriate. Bank of England, uh, ECB, um, you've got the, the, the Fed in there with Daly as well, the view from Asia, uh, all represented. It's been a really interesting week in terms of setting the tone. The surprise for me this week has been how hawkish European central bankers have sounded. Uh, Dave Ramson at the Bank of England, uh, Isabel Schnabel uh, over at the ECB. Dean Turner, UBS Global Wealth Management, Chief Eurozone and UK Economist, joining us now to discuss. Dean, we've got inflation data coming out of the Eurozone next week uh, and the component parts from the individual nations. We, I think mechanically, you're probably going to see that number coming down, but what is your expectation? We've got very high levels at the moment. Do you think the ECB is going to see any relief next week? Well, I would agree with what you said uh, there, Guy. I think just due to technicals alone, we're going to see the inflation number tick down a little. But your consensus is looking for, what, 10.4 against 10.6 uh, last month. So Six, yeah. that's what we should see. Um, but, you know, I, I think the key question, is, as, as you've said, is is that going to be enough to knock the ECB off of a pretty hawkish, uh, hawkish course they seem to be on? And um, my sense is that there won't be enough in, in the data uh, next week. Obviously, we'll all, always also be looking at core inflation. I think if we saw a, a, quite a sharp move in core inflation, that, that could be something. But, um, but that doesn't seem likely at this stage. So, you know, what we've heard, very hawkish, as, as you've already highlighted from uh, uh, central bankers, I, th I would expect to continue. Yeah, as you say, core is actually, I think core is probably going to be even more interesting. Um, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's expected to remain fairly stable at around 5%. You don't get the, the base effect there in the same way as you're going to see with the headline number. So if we see core sticking around those kinds of numbers, do you think the ECB goes 75 or do you think we, we kind of downgrade, downshift, as maybe the Fed's going to do next, to a 50 basis point hike? Well, we've had 50 basis points in for the ECB for, for some time, but, you know, I think we've got to accept that there's upside risk to that. I mean, just looking at uh, market pricing this morning, um, it's over 90% now for a 75 basis point hike. 
Um, so yeah, look, I mean, we're at 50, but clearly there's uh, the, there's upside risk to that. I don't think it necessarily changes the peak rate. Um, we're looking for rates to peak at 275 in the eurozone, uh, but perhaps they just get there a little bit sooner. In terms of the trajectory that inflation is on, though, mm -hmm. the data that I've looked at this week suggests that maybe the recession that we're going to see in Europe may be a little bit shallower. I saw that maybe out of the PMI, certainly saw that out of the EFO data as well. If we get that slightly shallower recession, does inflation remain a little stickier for longer? I think that's the clear risk, and look, I, I would share exactly what uh, what you said there about the data that's been coming out. It surprised me to the upside. I think it surprised everyone to the upside. So there's certainly um, a, a, a good chance now that what we already expected to be a shallow recession is much shallower. And if you don't, and, and if we don't see the the, the kind of demand destruction uh, that uh, that you would typically associate with a recession, that's going to bring pricing pressures down. It, it probably does point to inflation being stickier. I wouldn't be too worried about inflation moving higher under that scenario. It's perhaps just um, a little bit more persistence in the numbers. Um, and, you know, hopefully that, that would mean that central banks don't overreact to, uh, to, to, to that data. But clearly it probably would point to upside risk to, uh, to, to, to the level of rates, but also for how long they stay there. And clearly a lot of what we've, the moves that we've seen in uh, markets of, over the last couple of weeks has been on expectations of various central bank pivots, and that could easily be brought into question. Dean, how do you, how do you factor the weather into your thinking? Uh, and into your models. You, I looked at the German GDP data today and the consumer is clearly still holding in there. Um, but we are going into a winter which we don't know how cold it's going to be. How critical a factor is that and how, how do you model that? I think every economist is trying to be a, an amateur meteorologist these days. Um, the honest answer is we can't. Uh, we, we can't model this in. Uh, look, what, what we're assuming is that we get an average winter. Um, clearly, we've had, no, had a better than average winter so far, um, and that will be behind some of the uh, good um, you know, relief uh, that, that, that we've seen, uh, it's certainly in terms of gas prices. Um, but look, absolutely, if, if, we get, uh, if we get a much bigger draw on gas reserves uh, through December, and, and, and into January, then that, then that could uh, mean that prices rise. And we could even be in a situation in extreme cold winter where we have to start thinking about rationing again um, on continental Europe. So, yeah. you know, that, that, that mindset has changed quite a lot in the last, uh, in the last month or two, if, if you think about it. You know, we were all well concerned about rationing uh, two, three months ago. But because we've had this very mild start to the winter, um, that, those concerns are very much um, uh, on, on, on the, uh, in, in the on in the back sorry yeah <laughs> dean great stuff love it thank you very much indeed dean turner ubs global wealth management chief eurozone and uk economist thank you very much indeed i should add an amateur meteorologist onto the end of that maybe uh let's re check where european stocks have ended as i say very very quiet session today delivered with very very light volume this is bloomberg This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Ritika Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Kathy Entwistle of Morgan Stanley Private Wealth. That's noontime in New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm Ritika Gupta. Ukraine may soon be able to provide power to most users for up to 18 hours a day. Systems are being repaired after a barrage of Russian missiles attacks damaged the grid. Allies, including France and the Czech Republic, are donating power generating equipment. In the UK, London is expanding a controversial policy that's improved air quality and accelerated the move to electric vehicles. Drivers of older, high emitting cars have been charged. $15 a day to drive in London's central and inner boroughs. The policy will extend to the city's outer reaches in August. And nurses in the UK plan to stage their first ever nationwide strike for two days next month. It's a historic sign of defiance in a dispute over pay. The British government has said that calls for pay hikes 5% above inflation are not affordable.
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Guy. Ritika, thank you very much indeed. So big box retailers like Macy's are hoping consumer resilience can carry sales this holiday season. The company's CEO spoke to Bloomberg Television about the strength of the consumer. I think the consumer is still relatively healthy. And what I do think, though, is that there's the compounding effect of inflation all around the consumer in all sectors, you know, in services, in discretionary and non-discretionary categories. So our customers are feeling that. The Macy's CEO, let's uh, get a view of exactly what is happening right now. Maybe at Macy's and other stores. Kriti Gupta uh, is in Herald Square, one of New York City's busiest shopping districts. Kriti, you were telling me a little bit earlier on that it started busy and then it's got a little quieter. What's it looking like now? Well, it got quieter for a moment, and now it looks like the lunch rush is really coming in. It is actually pretty busy around here. A lot of families now coming out and checking out the department stores, not just, of course, Macy's, but around us we have Urban Outfitters, we have H&M. So you are really seeing it turn into a much more active shopping experience than, say, even an hour and a half ago. I will say, though, still not as busy as Black Friday's prior, but certainly uh, energy is increasing, not decreasing. Are you seeing just people walking around or are you seeing people walking around actually with shopping bags? Are they buying? They are buying. Now, this, is, I think, is the real difference that you've seen a change in the last hour and a half because before, and certainly in the morning hours, remember 6 a.m. is when Macy's opened, and you did have that very long line that wrapped around the block and then was finally let in. A lot of people were kind of going in, looking, and then coming out. And a few people, a few of the people, excuse me, that I spoke to kind of said, well, yeah, we kind of looked. You tried on the perfume. We tried on the jewelry. You tried on some clothes. But at the end of the day, the actual purchases were going to be made online. I think in the last hour and a half or so, remember, we're approaching lunchtime now, a lot more more tourism, a lot more people, and they are actually buying things. You are seeing shopping bags, and not just for Macy's, but like I said, for the stores around us. So perhaps it's a timing of the day thing. Guy also mentioned, of course, no stranger to you in London. It is starting to rain here, and even in the face of the cold weather <laughs> and the rainy atmosphere, they're still shopping. It's crazy. Hardcore shoppers. Uh, I am definitely not in that group. Critty, what, is, what was the expectation <laughs> for this shopping season? I, the consumer still is in relatively good shape. Employment remains pretty elevated still. The consumer does have money in the pocket to spend. They do. So I think the best way to answer the question is throw you some numbers. Look, inventories are supposed to be up 33% year over year. So there is a major pressure on a lot of these retailers to offer a lot of their merchandise at extreme markdowns, at extreme promotions. And at the same time, they have to not only retain the customer, get rid of their inventory, and still meet their bottom line. But on the consumer side, look, spending is expected to increase 2.5% year over year. So even though we are seeing perhaps the fading of the effect of stimulus checks, people are still buying, except on credit this time. And that isn't really shopping that, stopping them. They are still actually shopping at an increased pace relative to last year. So inflation, recession, that those things don't seem to be stopping consumers and, I really guess, by extension, retailers. Pretty great work. Thank you very much indeed for being out there and braving the weather for us. We really appreciate it. No sign of Alex Steele yet. Maybe she sat home on the sofa with the laptop okay. out. Um, okay. Let's talk about what is happening kind of in the broader shopping picture. The other big event that uh, obviously many of us are following is the World Cup. Uh, we've got a game taking place a little bit later on. I don't know if you heard between England and the United States. You're looking at a live shot uh, of the stadium uh, in Doha uh, as the crowds maybe begin to arrive. Uh, the England captain, Harry Kane, um, is a man of, of many skills and many talents uh, and importantly, many hats. Now, he's going to be playing tonight. We hope he does well. Uh, aside from playing in the FIFA World Cup, he is also investing in entertainment. Now, that's a funny word to say, and it's probably a funny word to describe, but the footballer is part of a new wave of businesses that are booming as the world emerges from COVID-19. When the World Cup comes around, there's a lot of pressure on this guy, Harry Kane, the England football captain. But in addition to his day job, can he also save that beleaguered temple of consumerism, the shopping mall? It may seem an unlikely matchup, but he's involved in a big bet on the future of shopping, of which more later. Let's start with the basics. The business model for shopping malls used to be pretty straightforward. You would offer cheap rent to a department store like Nordstrom or Macy's in the US or John Lewis and Debenhams in the UK, and they would become what is known as an anchor tenant. 
The idea is that they would bring in shoppers from miles around, which would then make it easier to attract smaller shops to fill the spots around it. And that would fill out your mall. E-commerce changed all that. If you could buy something online that would appear on your doorstep a day or two later, it was suddenly less appealing to drive miles to an out-of-town shopping centre. And department stores in particular suffered. Many of them closed down. That creates a problem for landlords who all of a sudden didn't have an anchor tenant. Which is where Harry Kane comes in. He's an investor in Toka Social, which is part of a new wave of businesses that are booming as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. I like to kind of maybe go at newer companies who maybe have a bigger growth and bigger uh, chance to, to expand. They're known as experiential entertainment or entertainment sometimes. Bars that incorporate another activity such as mini golf in the case of putt shack, darts in the case of flight club table tennis when it comes to bounce and football, soccer in the case of Toka Social. So the experiential entertainment economy has exploded in recent years and this is a trend we expect to accelerate. We're seeing a kind of remarked increase in people wanting to do more of their nights out beyond just eating and drinking. Um, and many people, well many companies have already applied the experiential entertainment model very successfully to different sports, most notably golf but also darts and, and others. Players get a little booth where they aim to hit moving targets on the screen with a football. You can have a beer and some chicken wings while your mates are playing. This isn't the bowling alley of your grandparents, there's all sorts of technical wizardry. The good news for shopping malls and their landlords is that these sort of spots attract families and kids during the day and the social crowd out for a drink in the evening. Department stores were always seen as, as, as the anchors of, of, of the shopping centres. I think, to be, to be frank, they hadn't anchored them in the way they were originally intended for quite a while. These are not new spaces by and large. I think there are some new concepts and there are new ways they're being managed. I think the key thing is that, is that it now has a wider reach. Uh, I think it's got a broader demographic, I think it's better engaged with the local customer. In many cases, locations that used to be occupied by department stores are now being offered to these experiential entertainment firms. That also means they're getting some of the same deals on the rent. In the case of Putt Shack, the setup costs are about $8 million, and in many cases, landlords are fronting as much as two-thirds of that to entice them in. It appears to pay off. Consumers played a million games of mini golf in Putt Shack's first year at its location in West London. And they take up a pretty big footprint too, 30 to 40,000 square feet. Not quite as big as the 70,000 square feet of a department store, but still bigger than a lot of other shops. Many of these concepts are originating in the UK before they cross the pond to the US. Putt Shack, which just raised $150 million from BlackRock, was founded by Stephen and Dave Joliffe, the same brothers who sold Top Golf to Callaway for $2 billion just a few years ago. The firm behind Bounce and Flight Club is based in London and just raised an additional $35 million in funding. Harry Kane invested in Toka Social in January. He's hoping that the business helps pay some of the bills when he ultimately gets around to retiring. The company aims to add as many as 50 sites in the UK and expand globally. I feel like this will grow uh, as the years go on and there will be tweets that are made along the way that will uh, improve it and you know maybe by the time I'm retired it will be in a really fantastic place and, and I can just maybe enjoy it playing football for fun instead of professionally. Harry Kane can't save the shopping mall on his own, nor can Toka Social. But landlords certainly hope that these sort of spots can give them a new lease of life. Nice piece from Alex Webb. Let's hope, let's hope Harry Kane has a good night. England versus the United States. It's going to be a big game. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> A couple more hours of US trading here with the action. Action. Thus far, Ed Ludlow. Yeah, thin volumes, the S&P 500 basically flat with energy being kind of an outperformer as a sector. Tech, we see weakness, largely a drag from Apple, uh, which is declining on reports that production in Zhengzhou has been hit by the disruption from protests. And part of the story being that yields continue to creep higher. But again, thin, thin volumes halfway through this shortened post-Thanksgiving session here in the US. S&P 500 flat as a pancake.
Ed, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. I know you will. Um, let's talk about what kicks off next week. Next week, quite a big week, actually. Lots of central bank speak that we're going to get. New York Fed President John Williams speaking at the Economic Club of New York. Monday, we've got the ECB's Christine Lagarde as well in the European Parliament. Uh, Tuesday, um, CPI out of Germany and Spain. You get earnings out of EasyJet and Salesforce. Catherine Mann and Isabel Schnabel uh, speaking as well. NATO foreign ministers meeting Wednesday. Uh, you've got Fed chair... Uh, they're meeting Tuesday. Wednesday, Fed chair. This is the big one. Jay Powell speaking at the Brookings uh, Institute. You get the Beige Book as well. You also get CPI data out for the Eurozone. That's the big number out of Europe uh, that next week. Um, you've also got President Biden meeting President Macron at the White House later in the week as well. Plus, you get the BOE inflation survey. Lots, lots coming up. We've got some great coverage lined up. Uh, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the game tonight. It's going to be fantastic. I look forward to talking with Alex Steele about it next week. This is Bloomberg.